Part D. Preferred Stock We only want to link up with people whom we like, admire, and trust. John Gutfreund at Solomon, Coleman Mockler Jr. at Gillette, Ed Colladney at US Air, and Andy Sigler at Champion meet this test in spades. They, in turn, have demonstrated some confidence in us, insisting in each case that our preferreds have unrestricted voting rights on a fully converted basis, an arrangement that is far from standard in corporate finance. In effect, they are trusting us to be intelligent owners, thinking about tomorrow instead of today, just as we are trusting them to be intelligent managers, thinking about tomorrow as well as today. The preferred stock structures we have negotiated will provide a mediocre return for us if industry economics hinder the performance of our investees, but will produce reasonably attractive results for us if they can earn a return comparable to that of American industry in general. We believe that Gillette, under Coleman's management, will far exceed that return and believe that John, Ed, and Andy will reach it unless industry conditions are harsh. Under almost any conditions, we expect these preferreds to return us our money plus dividends. If that's all we get though, the result will be disappointing, because we have given up flexibility and consequently will have missed some significant opportunities that are bound to present themselves during the decade. Under that scenario, we will have obtained only a preferred stock yield during a period when the typical preferred stock will have held no appeal for us whatsoever. The only way Berkshire can achieve satisfactory results from its four preferred issues is to have the common stocks of the investee companies do well. Good management and at least tolerable industry conditions will be needed if that is to happen, but we believe Berkshire's investment will also help and that the other shareholders of each investee will profit over the years ahead from our preferred stock purchase. The help will come from the fact that each company now has a major, stable, and interested shareholder whose chairman and vice chairman have, through Berkshire's investments, indirectly committed a very large amount of their own money to these undertakings. In dealing with our investees, Charlie and I will be supportive, analytical, and objective. We recognize that we are working with experienced CEOs who are very much in command of their own business, but who nevertheless, at certain moments, appreciate the chance to test their thinking on someone without tears to their industry or to decisions of the past. As a group, these convertible preferreds will not produce the returns we can achieve when we find a business with wonderful economic prospects that is unappreciated by the market, nor will the returns be as attractive as those produced when we make our favorite form of capital deployment, the acquisition of 80% or more of a fine business with a fine management. But both opportunities are rare, particularly in a size benefiting our present and anticipated resources. In summation, Charlie and I feel that our preferred stock investments should produce returns moderately above those achieved by most fixed income portfolios, and that we can play a minor but enjoyable and constructive role in the investee companies. Mistakes occur at the time of decision. We can only make our mistake du jour award, however, when the foolishness of a decision becomes obvious. By this measure, 1994 was a vintage year with keen competition for the gold medal. Here, I would like to tell you that the mistakes I will describe originated with Charlie, but whenever I try to explain things away, my nose begins to grow, and the nominees are Late in 1993, I sold 10 million shares of Cap Cities at $63. At year-end 1994, the price was $85 and a quarter. The difference is $222.5 million for those of you who wish to avoid the pain of calculating the damage yourself. When we purchased the stock at 1725 in 1986, I told you that I had previously sold our Cap Cities holdings at $4.30 per share during 1978 to 1980, and added that I was at a loss to explain my earlier behavior. Now I've become a repeat offender. Maybe it's time to get a guardian appointed. Egregious as it is, the Cap City's decision earns only a silver medal. Top honors go to a mistake I made five years ago that fully ripened in 1994. Our $358 million purchase of U.S. Air Preferred Stock, on which the dividend was suspended in September. This deal was an unforced error, meaning that I was neither pushed into the investment nor misled by anyone when making it. Rather, this was a case of sloppy analysis a lapse that may have been caused by the fact that we were buying a senior security or by hubris. Whatever the reason, the mistake was large. 
Before this purchase, I simply failed to focus on the problems that would inevitably beset a carrier whose costs were both high and extremely difficult to lower. In earlier years, these life-threatening costs posed a few problems. Airlines were then protected from competition by regulation, and carriers could absorb high costs because they could pass them along by way of fares that were also high. When deregulation came along, it did not immediately change the picture. The capacity of low-cost carriers was so small that the high-cost lines could, in large part, maintain their existing fare structures. During this period, with the longer-term problems largely invisible but slowly metastasizing, the costs that were non-sustainable became further embedded. As seat capacity of the low-cost operators expanded, their fares began to force the old line, high-cost airlines to cut their own. The day of reckoning for these airlines could be delayed by infusions of capital, such as ours into US Air, but eventually a fundamental rule of economics prevailed. In an unregulated commodity business, a company must lower its costs to competitive levels or face extinction. This principle should have been obvious to your chairman, but I missed it. Seth Schofield, then CEO of US Air, has worked diligently to correct the company's historical cost problems, but, to date, has not managed to do so. In part, this is because he has had to deal with a moving target, the result of certain major carriers having obtained labor concessions and other carriers having benefited from fresh start costs that came out of bankruptcy proceedings. As Herb Keller, CEO of Southwest Airlines, has said, bankruptcy court for airlines has become a health spa. Additionally, it should be no surprise to anyone that those airline employees who contractually receive above-market salaries will resist any reduction in these as long as their checks continue to clear. Despite this difficult situation, US Air may yet achieve the cost reductions it needs to maintain its viability long-term, but it is far from sure that will happen. Accordingly, we wrote our U.S. Air investment down to $89.5 million, or $0.25 cents on the dollar, at year-end 1994. This value reflects both a possibility that our preferred will have its value fully or largely restored, and an opposite possibility that the stock will eventually become worthless. Whatever the outcome, we will heed a prime rule of investing. You don't have to make it back the way that you lost it. The accounting effects of our U.S. Air write-down are complicated. On our balance sheet, we carry all stocks at estimated market value. Therefore, at the end of last year's third quarter, we were carrying our U.S. Air Preferred at $89.5 million, or 25% of cost. In other words, our net worth was at that time reflecting a value for U.S. Air that was far below our $358 million cost. But in the fourth quarter, we concluded that the decline in value was, in accounting terms, other than temporary and that judgment required us to send the write-down of $268.5 million through our income statement. The amount had no other fourth-quarter effect. That is, it did not reduce our net worth because the diminution of value had already been reflected there. Charlie and I will not stand for re-election to U.S. Air's board at the upcoming annual meeting. Should Seth wish to consult with us, however, we will be pleased to be of any help that we can. When Richard Branston, the wealthy owner of Virgin Atlantic Airways, was asked how to become a millionaire, he had a quick answer, there's really nothing to it, start as a billionaire and then buy an airline. Unwilling to accept Branson's proposition on faith, your chairman decided in 1989 to test it by investing $358 million in a 9.25% preferred stock of US Air. I liked and admired Ed Colodny, the company's then CEO, and I still do. But my analysis of US Air's business was both superficial and wrong. I was so beguiled by the company's long history of profitable operations and by the protection that ownership of a senior security seemingly offered me that I overlooked the crucial point. US Air's revenues would increasingly feel the effects of an unregulated, fiercely competitive market, whereas its cost structure was a holdover from the days when regulation protected profits. These costs, if left unchecked, portended disaster, however reassuring the airline's past record may be. To rationalize its costs, however, US Air needed major improvements in its labor contracts, and that's something most airlines have found it extraordinarily difficult to get, short of credibly threatening or actually entering bankruptcy. US Air was to be no exception. Immediately after we purchased our preferred stock, 
the imbalance between the company's costs and revenues began to grow explosively. In the 1990-1994 period, U.S. Air lost an aggregate of $2.4 billion, a performance that totally wiped out the book equity of its common stock. For much of this period, the company paid us our preferred dividends, but in 1994, payment was suspended. A bit later, with the situation looking particularly gloomy, we wrote down our investment by 75% to $89.5 million. Thereafter, during much of 1995, I offered to sell our shares at 50% of face value. Fortunately, I was unsuccessful. Mixed in with my many mistakes at US Air was one thing I got right, making our investment. We wrote into the preferred contract a somewhat unusual provision stipulating that penalty dividends, to run 5 percentage points over the prime rate, would be accrued on any arrears. This meant that when our 9 and a quarter dividends was omitted for two years, the unpaid amounts compounded at rates ranging between 13 and a quarter and 14 percent. Facing this penalty provision, U.S. Air had every incentive to pay arrears just as promptly as it could, and in the second half of 1996, when U.S. Air turned profitable, it indeed began to pay, giving us $47.9 million. We owe Stephen Wolf, the company's CEO, a huge thank you for extracting a performance from the airline that permitted this payment. Even so, U.S. Air's performance has recently been helped significantly by an industry tailwind that may be cyclical in nature. The company still has basic cost problems that must be solved. In any event, the prices of U.S. Air's publicly traded securities tell us that our preferred stock is now probably worth its par value of $358 million, give or take a little. In addition, we have over the years collected an aggregate of $240.5 million in dividends, including $30 million received in 1997. Early in 1996, before any accrued dividends had been paid, I tried once more to unload our holdings, this time for about $335 million. You're lucky. I again failed in my attempt to snatch defeat from the draws of victory. In another context, a friend once asked me, if you're so rich, why aren't you smart? After reviewing my soy performance with U.S. Air, you may conclude he had a point. In making the U.S. Air purchase, your chairman displayed exquisite timing. I plunged into the business at almost the exact moment that it ran into severe problems. No one pushed me. In tennis parlance, I committed an unforced error. The company's troubles were brought on both by industry conditions and by the post-merger difficulties it encountered in integrating Piedmont, an affliction I should have expected since almost all airline mergers have been followed by operational turmoil. In short order, Ed Colony and Seth Schofield resolved the second problem. The airline now gets excellent marks for service. Industry-wide problems have proved to be far more serious. Since our purchase, the economics of the airline industry have deteriorated at an alarming rate, accelerated by the kamikaze pricing tactics of certain carriers. The trouble this pricing has produced for all carriers illustrates an important rule. In a business selling a commodity-type product, it's impossible to be a lot smarter than your dumbest competitor. However, unless the industry is decimated during the next few years, our U.S. air investments should work out all right. Ed and Seth decisively addressed the current turbulence by making major changes in operations. Even so, our investment is now less secure than at the time I made it. Our convertible preferred stocks are relatively simple securities, yet I should warn you that, if the past is any guide, you may from time to time read inaccurate or misleading statements about them. Last year, for example, several members of the press calculated the value of all our preferreds as equal to that of the common stock into which they are convertible. By their logic, that is, our Solomon preferred, convertible into common at $38, would be worth 60% of face value if Solomon Common were selling at $22.80. But there is a small problem with this line of reasoning. Using it, one must conclude that all the value of a convertible preferred resides in the conversion privilege, and that value of a non-convertible preferred of Solomon would be zero, no matter what its coupons or terms for redemption. The point you should keep in mind is that most of the value of our convertible preferreds is derived from their fixed income characteristics. That means the security cannot be worth less than the value they would possess as non-convertible preferreds. 
and may be worth more because of their conversion options. Berkshire made five private purchases of convertible preferred stocks during the 1987-91 to period, and the time seems right to discuss their status. In each case, we had the option of sticking with these preferreds as fixed income securities or converting them into common stock. Initially, their value to us came primarily from their fixed income characteristics. The option we had to convert was a kicker. Our $300 million private purchase of American Express perks was a modified form of common stock whose fixed income characteristics contributed only a minor portion of its initial value. Three years after we bought them, the perks automatically were converted to common stock. In contrast, our other convertible preferred stocks were set to become common stocks only if we wished them to, a crucial difference. When we purchased our convertible securities, I told you that we expected to earn after-tax returns from them that moderately exceeded what we could earn from the medium-term fixed income securities they replaced. We beat this expectation, but only because of the performance of a single issue. I also told you that these securities as a group would not produce the returns we can achieve when we find a business with wonderful economic prospects. Unfortunately, that prediction was fulfilled. Finally, I said that, under almost any conditions, we expect these preferreds to return us our money plus dividends. That's one I would like to have back. Winston Churchill once said that eating my words has never given me indigestion. My assertion, however, that it was almost impossible for us to lose money on our preferreds has caused me some well-deserved heartburn. Our best holding has been Gillette, which we told you from the start was a superior business. Ironically, though, this is, however, the purchase in which I made my biggest mistake. Of a kind, however, never recognized on financial statements. We paid $600 million in 1989 for Gillette preferred shares that were convertible into 48 million split-adjusted common shares. Taking an alternative route with the $600 million, I probably could have purchased 60 million shares of common from the company. The market on the common was then about $10.50, and given that this would have been a huge private placement carrying important restrictions, I probably could have bought the stock at a discount of at least 5%. I can't be sure about this, but it's likely that Gillette's management would have been just as happy to have Berkshire opt for Common. But I was far too clever to do that. Instead, for less than two years, we received some extra dividend income, the difference between the preferred yield and that of the Common, at which point the company, quite properly, called the issue, moving to do that as quickly as was possible. If I had negotiated for common rather than preferred, we would have been better off at year-end 1995 by $625 million, minus the excess dividends of about $70 million. In the case of Champion, the ability of the company to call our preferred at 115% of cost forced a move out of us last August that we would rather have delayed. In this instance, we converted our shares just prior to the pending call and offered them to the company at a modest discount. Charlie and I have never had a conviction about the paper industry. Actually, I can't remember ever owning the common stock of a paper producer in my 54 years of investing, so our choice in August was whether to sell in the market or the company. Our champion capital gain was moderate, about 19% after tax from a six-year investment but the preferred delivered us a good after-tax dividend yield throughout our holding period. That said, many press accounts have overstated the after-tax yields earned by property casualty insurance companies on dividends paid to them. What the press has failed to take into account is a change in the tax law that took effect in 1987 and that significantly reduced the dividends received credit applicable to insurers. Our first Empire Preferred was to be called on March 31st, 1996, the earliest date allowable. We were comfortable owning stock in well-run banks, and we will convert and keep our first Empire common shares. Bob Wilmers, CEO of the company, is an outstanding banker, and we love being associated with him. Our two other Preferreds have been disappointing. Though the Solomon Preferred has modestly outperformed the fixed income securities for which it was a substitute. However, the amount of management time Charlie and I have devoted to this holding has been vastly greater than its economic significance to Berkshire. Certainly, I never dreamed I would take a new job at age 60. Solomon Interim Chairman
that is, because of an earlier purchase of a fixed income security. Soon after our purchase of Solomon Preferred in 1987, I wrote that I had no special insight regarding the direction or future profitability of investment banking. Even the most charitable commentator would conclude that I have since proved my point. To date, our option to convert into Solomon Common has not proven of value. Furthermore, the Dow Industrials have doubled since I committed to buy the preferred, and the brokerage group has performed equally well. That means my decision to go with Solomon because I saw value in the conversion option must be graded as very poor. Even so, the preferred has continued under some trying conditions to deliver as a fixed income security, and the 9% dividend is currently quite attractive. Unless the preferred is converted, its terms require redemption of 20% of the issue on October 31st of each year, 1995 to 99 and $140 million of our original $700 million was taken on schedule last year. Some press reports label this a sale, but a senior security that matures is not sold. Though we did not elect to convert the preferred that matured last year, we have four more bites at the conversion apple, and I believe it quite likely that we will find yet value in our right to convert. The common stocks of both Gillette and First Empire into which Berkshire's preferred have been converted, have risen substantially in line with the company's excellent performance. At year-end, the $600 million we put into Gillette in 1989 had appreciated to $4.8 billion, and the $40 million we committed to First Empire in 1991 had risen to $238 million. Our two laggards, U.S. Air and Solomon, meanwhile, have come to life in a very major way, in a transaction that finally rewarded its long-suffering shareholders. Solomon recently merged into Travelers Group. All of Berkshire's shareholders, including me very personally, owe a huge debt to Derek Moggin and Bob Damon. Owe a huge debt to Derek Moggin and Bob Denham. For first, playing key roles in saving Solomon from extinction following its 1991 scandal, and second, restoring the vitality of the company to a level that made it an attractive acquisition for travelers. I have often said that I wish to work with executives that I like, trust, and admire. No two fit that description better than Derek and Bob. Berkshire's final results from its Solomon investment won't be tallied for some time, but it is safe to say that they will be far better than I anticipated two years ago. Looking back, I think of my Solomon experience as having been both fascinating and instructional though for a time in 1991-1992, to when I was serving as its chairman, I felt like the drama critic who wrote, I would have enjoyed the play except that I had an unfortunate seat. It faced the stage. The resuscitation of U.S. airways borders on the miraculous. Those who have watched my moves in this investment know that I have compiled a record that is unblemished by success. I was wrong in originally purchasing the stock, and I was wrong later in repeatedly trying to unload our holdings at 50 cents on the dollar. Two changes at the company coincided with its remarkable rebound. One, Charlie and I left the board of directors, and two, Stephen Wolf became CEO. Fortunately for our egos, the second event was the key. Stephen Wolf's accomplishments at the airline have been phenomenal. There still is much to do at US Airways but survival is no longer an issue. Consequently, the company made up the dividend arrears on our preferreds during 1997, adding extra payments to compensate us for the delay we suffered. The Commons Commons stock furthermore has risen from a low of $4 to a recent high of $73. Our preferred has been called for redemption on March 15th, but the rise in the company's stock has given our conversion rights, which we thought worthless not long ago, great value. It is now almost certain that our U.S. Airways shares will produce a decent profit. That is, if my cost for Malix is excluded, and the gain could even prove indecent. Next time I make a big, dumb decision, Berkshire shareholders will know what to do. Phone Mr. Wolf. In addition to the convertible preferreds, we purchased one other private placement in 1991, $300 million of American Express perks. This security was essentially a common stock that featured a trade-off in its first three years. We received extra dividend payments during that period, but we were also capped in the price appreciation we could realize. Despite the cap, 
This holding has proved extraordinarily profitable thanks to a move by your chairman that combined luck and skill. 110% luck, the balance skill. Our perks were due to convert into common stock in August 1994. And in the month before, I was mulling whether to sell upon conversion. One reason to hold was Amex's outstanding CEO, Harvey Golub, who seemed likely to maximize whatever potential the company had, a supposition that has since been proved in spades. But the size of that potential was in question. Amex faced relentless competition from a multitude of cardholders led by Visa, weighing the arguments I leaned towards sale. Here's where I got lucky. During that month of decision, I played golf at Prutes Neck, Maine with Frank Olson, CEO of Hertz. Frank is a brilliant manager with intimate knowledge of the card business, so from the first tee on, I was quizzing him about the industry. By the time we reached the second green, Frank had convinced me that Amex's corporate card was a terrific franchise and I had decided not to sell. On the back nine, I turned buyer, and in a few months, Berkshire owned 10% of the company. We now have a $3 billion gain in our Amex shares, and I naturally feel very grateful to Frank. But George Gillespie, our mutual friend, says that I am confused about where my gratitude should go. After all, he points out, it was he who arranged the game and assigned me to Frank's foursome.